Welcome to the last of the um, uh, all 2023 IQB uh, seminars. It's a pleasure for me to be introducing today one of our own who's uh, who's batting cleanup. Um, uh, that's uh, Anders Lawson from Renew CO2, who uh, for a couple of years, I guess, two, three years, was uh, occupying part of the, uh, the third floor. So before I introduce... Andrews, I've got a couple of announcements to make. Uh, the first of which is that we want to uh, congratulate uh, Isabel Melendez Morales. Um, she worked in Darren York's lab over the summer as a RISE student and did very well. And um, most recently uh, was recognized for an outstanding presentation in the category of computational and systems biology at the Abercroms meeting, the annual biomedical research conference for minority scientists. And her, um, the title of her poster presentation was computational studies of the 18-7 DNA zyme in solution in the presence of magnesium. Uh, without, you know, if we didn't have magnesium, we couldn't, we couldn't live, right? It's, a, it's an absolutely essential uh, uh, lighter weight metal. Uh, so, um, also appearing in the author list of this uh, poster is Erica McCarthy, who is the subject of my next slide. Uh, and I want you to join me whenever you see her in the in the building uh, to uh, congratulate uh, Erica McCarthy, who has been awarded the 2024 IQB Inclusive Leadership Award, uh, re recognizing her outstanding achievements in training and uh, mentorship while uh, serving as a PhD student in, uh, in Darren's lab. So I don't think Erica's in the room, right? I don't see her. No, nope. no, nope, that's fine. Uh, anyway, uh, she will be notified. And the um, in addition to the the honor for uh, and putting the honor on her um, on her CV, um, she will travel at the Institute's expense to um, a scientific meeting and present uh, on behalf of the York Lab, presumably, present some of her research. And she will also have an opportunity to uh, network with prospective students and uh, uh, and postdocs uh, who we we would seek to uh, to attract to Rutgers. You know, so it's all part of the, the networking opportunity. So um, so congratulations uh, in absentia to uh, to Erica, who is a terrific addition to our community of scholars she was a rise student um and worked she worked with you didn't she darren as a rise student um, and, and then and, right after the rise program uh she should contact me okay she okay so i don't recall who she was working with during the rise program but um uh that was the impetus that got her to rutgers as a graduate student and um that's a, that's a program that um, many of us in this room value very highly. The RCSB Protein Data Bank has renewed its funding for another uh, five years uh, with uh, new awards starting from NSF, NIH, and DOE in 2024. And we are in the, in, um, the market for a number of uh, new team members, uh, both here at Rutgers and at UCSD. So specifically, we're looking for a, a DevOps specialist uh, here at Rutgers, of both front-end and back-end developers, software engineers here at Rutgers, and postdoctoral researchers in metalloproteins at Rutgers and bioinformatics at UCSD. As always, we are uh, interested in uh, attracting uh, interesting and highly competent students for gap year opportunities and for undergraduate summer research. So if you are aware of individuals you think should be applying for these jobs, please urge them to go to our jobs page, which is www.rcsp.org slash pages slash jobs. So with that, um, let me, let me, uh, Demonstrate my expertise with PowerPoint. If you, when you're in a PowerPoint presentation, if you hit B, the screen goes black. You can also, if you're in a dark room and you don't want the, to make the room completely black, then what you do is you hit W, and then that gives you a white screen. That 
useful tricks when you're giving talks. So you've learned something in PowerPoint that I bet you never you never uh, knew before. It's a um, the, the, the expertise in PowerPoint is like expertise in the in the game of pool. It's the sign of a misspent youth. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my pleasure and, uh, and an honor to be able to introduce uh, today's speaker for the IQB seminar series, uh, Dr. Anders B. Larsson. Uh, Anders is a native of Denmark uh, and received all of his uh, training at the Technical University of Denmark, doing a BSc in engineering, uh, then a, and a master's in engineering, and ultimately a PhD in the uh, Department of Physics. Um, he he came, I think, directly from um, Denmark to initially postdoctoral work and then uh, work as a research associate in our Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, and then became the founder and CEO of a spin out from uh, a tech biotech company spin out from the department uh, known as Renew CO2 uh, LLC. Uh, Anders has uh, on his CV a um, uh, a series of very important uh, publications that relate directly to the work that he's going to be describing uh, today. Um, and also he's um, listed it as an, an inventor on certain key patent applications that I'm assuming constitute the patent estate of this new company, Renew CO2. The, as I understand it, so I could get this wrong, but I think the goal, the, the vision that Anders and his teammates have at Renew CO2 is to be able to pull carbon dioxide out of the air and make fuel and other, other useful chemicals. And on the day of the closing of COP28 in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, this is a very, very important uh, objective to, uh, you know, to ultimately uh, realize we must stop burning fossil fuels uh, at some point as early as possible uh, within within the, the coming decade, decades, and anything we can do to take carbon dioxide out of the air and create a virtuous cycle where we pull the CO2 out of the air, we make fuel, we burn it, we put the CO2 back in the air and we just go around and around and around like that, um, is, as the greenery uh, on the earth pulls the CO2 out of the atmosphere and stores it there, Along with efforts to actually pull CO two out of the out of the air and and bury it very you know sequester it deep in the uh, in the ground, all of these steps are going to be necessary if we're going to overcome the the challenges of climate change. Um, we've just come through the we're on the tail end, hopefully a waning tail end of the COVID nineteen pandemic. This is arguably, I think, a much bigger threat to civilization than, than COVID-19 was. So Andrew's team has been recognized with startup funds from angel, angel investors, funds from venture capitalists. Those of, who, those of us who have had experience with venture capitalists might sometimes refer to them as vulture capitalists. Um, it is a it's a venture capital money is a double-edged sword, and I'm sure Anders is discovering that. But what what isn't a double-edged sword is the money that he and his team got from the Gates Foundation, which was very sizable, and uh, helped propel Renew CO2 to more VC money and an opportunity to expand mm -hmm. and outgrow the third floor. And so he and his team are now you're in based in Cranbrook, is that right? No, we are in Somerset. Somerset, but you okay? So you're. Oh, headquarters. Your headquarters are in Cranford, uh, NJ, but yes. So they have a new lab facility in um, in Somerset, which I think you're having some grand opening tomorrow. Uh, and uh, congratulations. It's uh, It will be very gratifying years from now to be able to point to the success of Renew, Renew CO2 and say, they got their start in this building here at Rutgers. They came out of our Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, and it's playing a key role in... Um, in helping to, co to combat climate change. So welcome, Anders. It's great to have you back. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I named my talk, Making Value Added Products from Carbon Dioxide, um, and really trying to take you guys through 
the initial discovery in the chemistry department into where we are now, where we are looking forward to building a pilot scale facility. And if I can advance my slide. So I took the, um, the Paris Accord as, as my example. Uh, Stephen just gave us the COP28. Um, so we agreed almost, we're getting close to a decade now ago that we should do something and we had to be carbon neutral by 2050. A lot of big companies agreed. Um, part of the issue was that there is not still today a lot of solutions to what to do with that carbon dioxide except for trying to push it underground and hope and pray it stays there. Um, so what we are looking at is a different way of utilizing it to again make value added products. Um, and we borrowed inspiration from Enzyme and I realized something shifted in my graph here. So the circle was supposed to be at the top around those dots. So enzymes are really the best in the world at taking CO2 and turning it into um, products with a high efficiency. So the energy efficiency, the Faraday efficiency, which we're talking about electron to product efficiency, over potential in, in our language is how much extra energy do we have to drive, put into a reaction to drive it? So zero volt over potential is basically a delta G of zero. And anything beyond that is to drive over any reaction barriers, as, as I'm sure everybody here is very familiar with. Um, and usually you have to drive over fairly high barriers in this kind of chemistry because we're taking things from a thermodynamic sink or hole of CO2 and trying to bring it back up to what it used to be um, without going all the way to trying to make oil necessarily because that, that's a lot of electrons and electricity is not that cheap yet. Um, so we took inspiration from nature's enzymes um, in the start of our discovery. And in particular, we looked at enzymes that do CO2 reduction. And in this case, we have a carbon monoxide dehydrogenase. Um, and one of the things we noted was it had transition elements that are fairly cheap, nickel and iron. They are bound to sulfur and nitrogen groups. I'm like, okay, that's a motif. They're under coordinated, fairly under co low coordinated nitrogen. Um, so nickel in this. Um, and one we thing, other thing we uh, note is that there is a lot of uh, back donation possibilities with, between the histidines and the iron, for instance. And so how can we design an inorganic scaffold that sort of mimics this? We can't do it exactly like that, but what can we do that looks uh, akin to that and still is quite stable outside of the projected body of an enzyme? So um, here in the bottom right corner, we have our, our um, initial discovery in nickel phosphide. This is a compound called Ni2P, so nickel 2, phosphorus 1, stoichiometrically. And here in the surface, you'll see uh, phosphorus is in purple and uh, nickels are blue. And you have a unit cell here where you have a triangle of nickels sitting. This phosphorus is actually below the surface, it's the subsurface, and then coordinated to uh, phosphorus is around the side. Um, we believe that the phosphorus here acts as a hydride binder. So normally when we talk about hydrogen binding to a surface, it will either be atomic hydrogen, so net zero charge. It could be a proton, that positive charge, a partial positive charge in the bound state, or a hydride where we actually have donated electron uh, density onto the hydrogen atom. And from a CO2 reduction perspective, that's very uh, intriguing because we can actually take CO2 and give it hydrogen and electrons at the same time, instead of a sequential step that computational uh, chemistry has shown has fairly at large barriers. So we can maybe circumvent some of these high barriers by donating hydrides. So we believe that this is part of why uh, these compounds, I'm skim ahead a little, they work well, um, but I'm going to go into a little bit more details about it. So we wanted materials that were active, stable, and conductive because we do have to get electrons to the active site. So having something that's inherently non-conductive it's going to make our lives a lot harder, introduce again, additional energy barriers. Um, so tertiary metal phosphides were a very new class of materials in electrochemistry at the time. Um, they were just been shown to be very active for hydrogen evolution. And at the time, everybody, and I believe that's my next slide. Everybody said, uh, this is from Nurskov, who is a, a, a brilliant chemist. I had a pleasure to working with him um, partly during my PhD. Um, their group hosted this, which is basically a summary of what everybody thought we knew at the time is we need to go through CO, so CO2 to CO, that has to be bound to a surface. We then had to change the absorption of that CO to go from a sort of pointing upwards um, to a CHO that's now parallel to the surface. And we have to bend some back donation to do that. That's where our main energy barrier is. That's why most CO2 electrolysis requires a lot of oil potential. And we have to do that at the same time as we don't make hydrogen, because I'll show you in a, in a little bit, the thermodynamic barriers 
uh, for CO2 reduction, hydrogen are very similar. So you always have a competition with hydrogen evolution, which if you're trying to make just one product is, is not necessarily what you want to do. So we have to have something that's terrible at hydrogen evolution. Now, we spun that on, our, on the head a little bit because we thought, well, we still have to activate the hydrogen. We just talked about the importance of donating hydrogen to CO2. So if we have a terrible hydrogen catalyst, it's not going to be likely to donate the hydrogen to anything. So we might not actually want a terrible hydrogen evolution catalyst. We might actually want a decent enough hydrogen evolution catalyst that we can then direct do CO2 reduction instead. So that's what we set out to do. Um, one of the, here's a list of ideal things that your, your catalyst, if you go in and just pick and choose, would have, it would have high selectivity for one product, do moles of proton and, and or electron transfers, very low potentials, obviously stable, and work as aqueous media. Um, and then have high current densities, which is basically electrochemistry speak for high rates. You want to do as high rates as possible. Um, so we started to look at several classes of nickel phosphides. This is uh, the work, um, a thesis work of our CTO, Karen Calvino. And I also am showing two graduates, uh, undergraduates that were working on the project at the time. Um, Tim has now uh, graduated from Northwestern, now in industry, and uh, Kyra is, is at Stanford. Uh, so brilliant people contributed to this work. So the, uh, the title of, of paper was Selective CO2 Reduction to C3 and C4 Oxyhydrocarbons on a Nickel Phosphide um, at over potentials as low as 10 millivolts. So that's very low over potentials for reference. Um, what was known before that was at least uh, 600 to 1,000 millivolts over potential, up to a volt over potential. And this was on tin to make formic acid, so just a C1 compound. And then you had to actually take that any, any further. So there was not a lot of the things being done that could make higher hydrocarbons uh, or oxyhydrocarbons at low potentials at the time. So uh, here is a little snapshot of the, the, the compounds that were made. Um, we started by synthesizing these materials and we went by, uh, for a solid state um, procedure, which is very simple, gives us high crystallinity of the product so we can actually start to make guesses based on the structure of the materials as to what could a mechanism look like. So Basically, you take the elements, red phosphorus, which you know from your matchbooks, um, elemental nickel, and you grind it together. You don't, not, don't add a lot of heat, but you add some heat. Um, you grind it together, you seal it in vacuum in a core champule, and you pop it in an oven at about 700 to 850 degrees, depending on the material. And you get a very nicely crystalline material here. On the right, you can see the, um, the, the, the red trace is the... Um, it's database structure. The blue trace is what they uh, look like after the reaction and the green before. I realize green is a little hard to see at this size from the back of the room, but basically they're identical. So we have very high crystallinity, single phase compounds. So we took that, we mixed it with a, with a polymer binder, pressed it in, in a press, as you can see here, fairly high pressures to make a flat surface. This is the closest thing we could get from a powder to a metal foil kind of flat surface where we can take out um, most of the considerations of mass transport because we can we can have a very um, narrow Helmholtz layer, which is essentially your diffusion layer. Because in electrochemistry, we like to call it something else sometimes just to, to make ourselves feel special. Um, so we made these uh, five different compounds in the series. So nickel phosphide have very, very uh, rich chemistry. So it requires some optimization work to get these compounds phase pure, but we were able to do it. Um, one of the things that we, we noticed was that in particular, the high phosphorus compound, this is NIP2, so the highest phosphorus content phase, actually tended to rearrange in the electrochemical cell during reactions. So we started to see the appearance of new phases here indicated with dots, and it rearranges from a monoclinic structure to a cubic structure. Now, the cubic structure it was known, it was not a new discovery, but it's actually only achieved normally under very high pressure. And we were surprised to see that under electrochemical condition at ambient conditions in water, we were actually able to have a rearrangement to that structure. Um, essentially what happens is that two phosphorus that are far away from the center in the um, monoclinic structure, you have a basically a square plane of coordination, phosphorus around nickel. Two pendant phosphorus moves from far away, a bit closer, so they start to have bonding interactions and you get these octahedra uh, structures in the cubic phase. So, so it's a, a small relative change. We tested this in, in our uh, own cell that we developed for the purpose of this, made over at the machine shop over in physics. Um, so it's a round cell, uh, bat cell. Um, what you'll notice is we have a platinum anode, which we bubble CO2 through and just vent out the oxygen. We have a membrane sitting in between here that's not shown. And then in the working compartment, 
we have a glass bridge machined in here that sits here and allows bubbles to go up in front of the electrode that's pushed from the other side. So we get very good mixing of the CO2, very high saturation of the CO2 at any given time. And then it goes out from this and it goes to a GC for us to measure hydrogen evolution, any other gaseous products that we would be making. Uh, also has a port here for reference electrodes so we can uh, conveniently reference our um, potentials of the cell to some known standard. In this case, it would be a mercury mercury sulfate electrode that we would be using some, as a reference. So this is the series of experiments. So on the, um, on the axis in the, in, in the plane here, we have the different materials. And then we have the applied or voltage here. So this is the further down here, you get the more energy you have applied in excess of what we thermodynamically need. What we want to see is a high Faraday efficiency, so high current electron, uh, electron if, if, uh, efficiency. And then you can see the different products made. So in particular, um, Ni2P here is very interesting. It can be a little bit hard to follow in the 3D plane, but here you have a very high peak, almost about 100% uh, efficiency on the electrons. And we make a lot of this compound 2,3-boron diol. 2,3-boron um, diol is not really a known species that we, we can go out and buy or do making petrochemically. There's not a lot of people who have any reason to make it, uh, but it's a quite interesting uh, from a new plastic perspective. It's an aromatic, obviously, diol. Uh, there's a lot of investigation, specialty polymers going into using aromats there because they have higher um, efficiency at higher temperatures and so on. So that's one uh, potential use for this, this compound that we've seen. Um, the other thing we see is that the high phosphorus content, the NIP2, we have a very high efficiency for methyl glyoxal. Now, some of you might have run across that in, in the metabolism um, of, of pure aldehyde, as is probably more commonly known. Um, this is a very reactive compound. You can use it to make imidazoleums. It doesn't have a very big market as on its own today, but we see a lot of potential in this uh, polymer, uh, to make polymers of this that can be used, again, as Steven said, um, potentially as fuels. Um, we see very little forming acid or formate across all of them. But you can see as you increase the amount of, of um, phosphorus going from here to here, you start to see different chemistries. And so they're very structure dependent chemistries and they're very potential dependent chemistry. In general, we see more of, of the C2, uh, CO2 reduction reaction happening at lower potentials. That's good because it means high energy efficiency. What is not illustrated here is the rest of the charts, the, the rest of the bars from here to 100, that's hydrogen. And just for being able to actually see what's going on, we've eliminated the hydrogen, but that's the, the, the re residual. So I, I promised to get back to the thermo, uh, the, um, the thermochemistry, the, um, the, the, the thermodynamics, sorry. Uh, so hydrogen evolution at standard conditions, zero volts over potential, that's how we have defined zero in electrochemistry. Um, basically the equilibrium between water and protons. Uh, formic acid production requires a little bit of a negative potential, meaning a little bit higher energy compared to hydrogen. So you require about 20 millivolts over potential thermodynamically to make formate. Methyl glyoxal requires no potential, thermodynamically speaking, versus hydrogen. So here you can see part of the trick is if we can have compounds that are thermodynamically favored to hydrogen and we run our reaction at a potential that's a little bit lower so we don't drive hydrogen too hard, we can start to make very high efficiency of our products. So these are favored. Um, what I alluded to before, as we go through the series of nickel phosphide and we look at the specific current density towards CO2 reduction. You can see you go from the most metal rich compounds, the most phosphorus rich compound. And there's a rough trend, I would say, maybe not a linear correlation, but a rough trend towards higher activity for CO2 reduction as we add more phosphorus into the compound. Um, this again is Ni2P. This is our favorite compound because it embodies both high activity and it's quite stable. Now the trick about this one is that it's not terribly stable. Um, so, so it's hard to work with. Um, but this is where, where we are. So again, we have these uh, nickel triangles in the surface. Uh, DFT calculations have suggested that you might even have additional phosphorus binding in the center of that nickel triangle, making uh, sort of a tetrahedral binding site. And that phosphorus has a very good hydrogen binding energy for making hydrogen. It's very, very low potentials to drive hydrogen evolution. So if we can avoid that binding of the phosphorus there, then we can potentially push our compounds a little bit further. So that all goes into our thinking about optimization. 
um, I wanted to put up the mechanism here for what we think is going on. So um, part of what we did, just going to do the animations here. Part of what we did was we, we started from CO2 and you can see here how much of each, um, how many, um, in this case, micromole of each compound we made over a given reaction time. Then we said, okay, we speculate that this is the mechanism. So we go from CO2 to formate. We see formate in the solution. So that's a pretty good guess that our mechanism has to go through formate. Um, formate can be released. That's what the blue uh, reversible error indicates that it can be released from the service, but uh, taken back up. We then think we go to formaldehyde. And the reason is that we are, we are seeing these compounds that are, um, looks like aldo couplings of something. And so formaldehyde is very good at aldo coupling. Um, and it could go from formaldehyde to glucoaldehyde to glyceraldehyde and then methylgloxal by a dehydration mechanism. We think we can get to methylgloxal. Now, how do we prove that? Well, we start with formate as our input instead of CO2. Still runs, it still gives us about the same product distribution. Okay, then next step, formaldehyde. Same thing, we can make all the compounds further down the chain from formaldehyde. Okay, so glucoaldehyde and glyceraldehyde, not as easy to get um, as, as, a pre, as an, an initial compound. So we start from methylgloxal because we can get that um, from sigma, for instance, and we actually see formation of the C4. Uh, we have ad not added any CO2 at this point. This is all done under argon in a non-carbonate containing electrolyte. So we, we've substituted our normal bicarbonate with um, pyrosulfate in this, uh, pyrophosphate in this case. Um, so there's not really another carbon source. So how can that be? Well, methyl glyoxal, what we speculate is that these energy barriers here in, in kilocals are very low. So potentially methyl glyoxal actually is in a constant equilibrium all the way back to form formaldehyde. And some of it ran backwards, build a little formaldehyde, and then that helped it go all the way because we need another formaldehyde here to go to our C4. So we believe that there's actually an accurate, uh, active uh, equilibrium all the way back that can occur on the surface, uh, which we thought was really intriguing. But it allows us to make these three major products uh, very efficiently. We think we have a decent um, stab at the mechanism here. Um, since uh, a, a lot of, um, not a lot, but a fair few uh, computational studies have been published that seems to verify the uh, mechanism that we're suggesting. Um, so, so we're very happy about that. Um, so the uh, Andrew Raps group from UPenn had, had done some uh, computational on this, which seems to confirm that this could go this way. So what have we achieved? We've reduced CO2 to C3s and C4s at very high selectivity at low potentials. The hydride transfer, we believe, again, based on the computational hydrogen binding of, of hydrides, what, I didn't show that here, but those hydrogens um, on the phosphorus add atoms, or all of the hydro hydrogens adding to the surface seem to be hydritic. So if you calculate the uh, charge on those hydrogens uh, during your, the DFT calculation, you can actually see that they have a slight negative charge. So we believe they're hydride-like. You can de debate how much like a hydride they are, but they are somewhere in that range. Um, the high energy efficiency is important for us as a company because we don't want to waste electrons. We don't want to waste renewable electricity because in the end that will cost our customers money. Um, so we want to drive this as highly energy efficient as possible. And that helps us compete with the conventional routes out there. Um, so far, we found that the best catalysts were Ni2P and, and NiP2, depending on which product you are targeting. Um, what is not in that original paper is that um, after that, we discovered that adding in uh, a Lewis acid, a boric acid actually, we could change the selectivity almost completely to make ethylene glycol. Now ethylene glycol, unlike the other ones that don't really have use today, that has a massive market. And so that was one of the things that kicked the company off. So looking a little at the different products, this is in terms of CO2 impact, but you can basically equate that to the market size, right? Because the more um, you can put CO2 in there, the bigger the market is, the more chemicals of these we make today. Um, so up in the left corner, we have uh, monoethylene glycol, or ethylene glycol, it's used in polyester. So a lot of the fabrics that we are wearing today, uh, polyester, it's made from this compound. Um, it's today, it's made from ethylene. So you will take natural gas, in some cases actually coal, you'll crack it, you'll make ethylene. You take your ethylene, you oxidize it over a catalyst. That's fairly efficient over the last 50 years. We've done a lot of improvement, but it still puts out between um, 10 to 30% of that incoming S, um, ethylene comes out as CO2. 
a very pure stream, stream of CO2, but this is just basically wasted energy, waste fossil resources. So we believe that that's an interesting um, market, uh, both from, in terms of size and in terms of impact uh, for the climate. You can see here formic acid is another one that, that has received a lot of attention. It's mainly used today in um, tanning, the tanning industry to acidify uh, when you're tanning leather, um, a little bit in agricultural use for um, basically for preserving um, animal feedstock, silage, um, losing a little bit of favor there these days. And then it's used as a de-icer. It's actually a really good de-icer. So normally in New Jersey this time of year, you'll start seeing all the grass along the side of the road dies whenever we put out road salt. And it's uh, all the sodium chloride will go out and will kill everything that's alive around it. It also is not too good for our bridges, which was what caught me an issue today, I think, because uh, they've closed um, Landing Lane because they have to repair the bridge. Um, sodium chloride goes into the concrete, start to attack the iron in there, and that's a big problem for our infrastructure and also for CO2, actually, because now we have to make more concrete, which is very CO2 heavy, to make new bridges, new iron, to make the, the, the reinforcement, the rebar. So all of this sort of ties together. Formate, uh, potassium formate in particular, the brine of that, very efficient, gets taken up by, by um, by the plants fairly easily and gets um, get back into CO2, unfortunately, but, but it does not kill the plants. So it has a lot of favor there, especially for things like airplane, uh, airfields, where you don't wanna have uh, a lot of issues because you're, re, you're yourself responsible for, for remaking the landing strips when they die uh, because of that. So they actually have an incentive because it's the same units doing it. Unfortunately, not out on the roads, it's two different people or two different departments doing the, the winter maintenance and the reconstruction, and they won't both want to be kept busy, so they don't really care about changing the, the status quo there. And it's also, you know, if you go to a football game, I don't know at Rutgers, but other places, you will use this as a de-icer around stadiums because it doesn't drag in and make that white sludge all over the carpets inside, so it actually helps there as well. Um, very interesting compound. Propylene glycol, used again in, in fabrics. Um, and methyl glyoxal, as you said here, we've assumed that you could use it as a replacement for formaldehyde because it has a lower vapor pressure. So some of you might have read or even experienced when you buy IKEA furniture that has a lot of formaldehyde resins in there, they outgas a little bit of formaldehyde as they're sitting over the first time in your home. Um, this has a very, very low vapor pressure. It should not have that same issue. So in terms of trying to speculate a market um, size, that's what we've used here. For on dial, we are saying maybe it could be used for bisphenol A as a replacement. Again, these are speculative markets, so take the impact here with a grain of salt. Um, future markets that we are looking at is fuels, as, as Stephen said before, jet fuel in particular. Uh, I think everybody has agreed collectively that gasoline, and in, in, at least in cars, are not going to be a thing in the future. So uh, jet fuel is one that's very hard to do battery-driven planes that can actually take a lot of people. So that's one place where there's a lot of attention being put right now is to make CO2 back into jet fuel so you can close the loop. Um, diesel as well, the same thing. Um, so these are the things that we are looking at just to give you an idea of scale. So methyl glyoxyl, we would need about 100 gigawatt power of installed capacity. And this in electrochemistry not being a very um, well-known thing in the chemical industry, the biggest uh, comparison we have is the chloralkali industry that makes all our bleach, and chlorine for other uses, uh, as well as sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. There's only 100, uh, 17 gigawatts installed right now. So it's an order of magnitude bigger problem that we've solved before. We still think that's doable, but gives you a sense of, of how much we actually have to do in a short amount of time to have a real impact. So we think we can replace fossil fuels by upgrading CO2 and turning it into particular plastics and fuels. Um, but we think the key is to have a cost effective way of doing it because nobody's really going to do it unless they can see some, some sort of benefits, at least on the corporate side. Um, the chemical industry is an interesting place. So we talked about uh, climate goals. So we have the customer facing brands, the ones that you and I have uh, influence on when we go out and buy something. So you can take Patagonia as an example, very climate conscious company. They have goals for their own emissions and they also have goals that they um, um, put on their tier one suppliers. You have to reduce your emissions to do trade with us. And all of that creates actual pull on the chemical industry. Now, um, governments and so on, the Paris Accords, all of those things, 
creates a push on the chemical industry to actually move forward. Um, but the chemical industry is sitting and saying, well, sure, but we don't really have a good solution that's scaled yet. So what do we do? So they have a lot of incentive to try something new in terms of getting to net zero. So again, I touched briefly upon polyester. This is our idea. You go from ethylene to um, ethylene oxide, essentially, in your uh, MEG production. That releases a lot of CO2. Each plant releases around 700, uh, 500 uh, kilotons of CO2 per year per plant. Now, there are about 200 producers worldwide, maybe 500 to 1,000 plants. They're all in the um, thousands of tons production a year. The huge facilities um, cost billions of dollars to construct. What we are saying to them is take your CO2 emissions, instead of emitting them, put them into our process. You can make more of the product you already made and you can sell it instead of having a cost to try and sequester that CO2. So that's the, um, the value proposition that we bring to the chemical industry. And you can do all of this on site with our modular solution. So you don't have to go out and, and buy 10 lots next to your plant to do this or pump it over however far. We can actually install something that's modular compact on your site to do this. So we see that as a very um, um, opportune moment, um, uh, good opportunity for us to go in. Now, the core of the chemistry is we have CO2 coming in. This is an electrochemical cell schematically shown. So we have CO2 coming in at the bottom left. We reacted with protons coming across our membrane. We stitch together our um, ethylene glycol and then it goes out, we recover it. I may get sound very simple. I'll go into some of the details that goes into that purification, but it is overall fairly simple. We have a membrane, proton conducting membrane. You know those probably from fuel cells. They, they're fairly standard these days. And on the other side, you have water coming in. You oxidize that to oxygen. You release the protons that cross the membrane. The oxygen can come out. And, and so far, there's no emission standards on your oxygen. That, that's fairly prevalent. Um, so we can emit that, or we can use it in the existing uh, industry on site. So we just have to dry it because it comes out wet. So the overall reaction is CO2, water, and electricity goes into directly into our product in one chemical reactor. This is what we imagine it looking like. So this is a shipping container because we want to make it modular so we can make them wherever and drop them on site at the chemical producers and they can then hook them up and then increase the capacity as their needs grow. So that maybe can match the market growth. That's not quite a billion uh, dollar facility every year. Uh, right now, the chemical industry, well, I was talking to a, a fellow that, that had been in, in the chemical industry for many years and he said, the worst feeling I've ever had is to go into a boardroom and say, we have to build this new facility and we have to gamble the company on there is going to be demand in the future for this chemical that I'm proposing. And he was like, it doesn't matter how big your company is, it's multinational. You are always, if you start building something for on the order of $2 billion, you're betting the company. And so he said that was the worst feeling he's ever had. And that's the market we can go in. That's where we can help because we can lower that cost for each unit by making it modular and you don't have to build the giant thing every time. And so that helps us both penetrate the market, but also helps the, the customers leveling out their, uh, their financial risk over time. So this is how we imagine it doing it. Um, so we start with a phase one demonstration. This is our little workhorse, five centimeters square. We started at three centimeters square in the academic lab. We went up to a five centimeter square platform. The good thing about this one is we can start to make things continuous flow instead of having a batch. Stage two is our scale up where we are um, going up in size from five centimeters to 500 centimeters square. So everything is in terms of the electrode area. Then the next stage is our pilot, which is where we are at now. 500 centimeter square with five cells in a stack to prove that we can actually run multiple of these in parallel at the same time. And then the next step up for us is between one and three meters square electrode size areas, which is the commercial ones. And then we built, start building the containers to ship these out. So that, that's our um, proposed plan. And you can see here how, if we get, get it to these current ranges, what that means in terms of how much material we can actually make in a day. So. At this point, when we get to the full commercial units, we are talking about about two um, ton of MEG from each unit per day. So it start to be real um, tangible amounts of um, material. The good thing is they're retrofitable because you're just pumping gas from your, from your exhaust line over to our facilities. You don't have to shut down the plant to put this in. Uh, it's cost competitive by our calculation at scale with the, uh, what you're doing today. So there's not an additional cost to, cons uh, to producers or consumers in the back end. So we can actually do this and it makes financial sense today at scale. 
it's a little caveat there. Um, what we started out doing was a lot of TEA and LCA analysis of this using some of the tools available. So we started comparing raw material costs because then we don't have to worry about is this done at current scale? What it, does this look like compared to the um, what Shell is doing today? So that's the case on the left. So the far left here, this is the North American average cost of electricity. Uh, this is at the time $55 a megawatt hour. This is the electricity cost. We are by far driven by electricity cost. Um, if we look at what it is in the Houston shipping channel right now at wholesale costs, they're down in $25 a megawatt hour. Substantially lower our cost. This is where we think the world is heading. Most recently, uh, Saudi Arabia said that they were down near uh, two, uh, $20 a megawatt hour, and they think they can get down to $10 a megawatt hour. So now we are starting to see uh, electricity, and this is renewable electricity from solar panels there, um, electricity costs are coming down where it actually makes sense, a lot of sense. Um, we can compare that to the conventional production, which mainly comes from the cost of ethylene put in. There are a couple of um, competitors for up hours in the various spaces that are doing this. Um, you can start with bioethanol. Bioethanol is fairly expensive. Um, they can do that today. They take ethanol, dehydrate it into ethylene, and then they run the conventional process on it. That reduces the CO2 impact. You can see that over here. Petrochemical is here, starting from bioethanol is here. You still have CO2 emissions associated with the conventional part of the process. Um, this is uh, India glycol's process. This is what, if you pick up a Dasani water bottle, it'll say it's plant bottle on it. That means that they've done this to get some plant derived material in there. Um, coal, mainly done in China, um, terribly polluting, not terribly uh, economically. Very good, you can see the capital cost is very high. The reason is um, it's a fairly difficult process. It goes through explosive intermediates. You can't build your facility very big because if it goes poof, it goes real bad. Um, so they've limited the size of the facilities that they can build. And so that limits the economics. Um, we believe that we are somewhere here where we are actually carbon negative. This is using uh, wind energy as the input in terms of our CO2 emissions, but taking in the life cycle from cradle to gate we can actually be negative by about 1.2 tons of CO2 per ton of product. Um, again, capital cost, more or less comparable with the conventional production. So we don't think that there's a penalty there. And so overall, this is what we based our initial um, projection on that we can be cost competitive. Now, um, that's sort of our um, initial, we, we're further developing this with, with more in-depth uh, TEAs as we go along. Um, but this is to give you a sense of where we were. So we started with the five centimeter square test stations. We now have 10 of those going up in, when we were up on the third floor, we had four. So we tried to push out a bit more. Um, we have our small cell, which is actually an intermediate size of a five, uh, 100 centimeter square, five stack, you can see here. And then this is our pilot. So 500 centimeter square each cell, five stack. This has been run for a thousand hours. We did that just before we, we did our move and we were very excited that it did really well on that. So. Future commercial size, another thousand fold, uh, hundred fold, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, another 10 times only um, increase in size of the individual electrodes. And then of course, many, many more units uh, in depth. So this is what our next milestone is to build our pilot that can produce one ton a year. So using that same cell that you just saw that we already built and then integrating it into a small container. Uh, this is what it approximately could look like. Um, has all of the purification built in, go from CO2 on the inlet to our end product on the outlet. We actually sold one of these already to um, a major, I'm not allowed to say the name, major uh, automotive producer in Europe. So you can, they're based in Germany, so to narrow it down. Um, but um, they have actually very interested in this because all the seat covers are made of polyester. And so they have a lot of material in their cars that they would like to make from carbon negative materials. Um, we started building our uh, purification system. So the first step of purification after out, coming out of the electrochemical cell is we want to remove any ions, any carbonates that have been formed during the reaction that we put in as supporting electrolytes, any formate, because formate is a killer for the polymerization reaction later on. So this is a technology developed at Argon that we have co-developed uh, a spin-out on. So uh, this is called um, resin wafer deionization. So you're basically applying a potential over a cell, pulling out the ions directly from the water stream and you get your product out um, basically deion. So it's like a reverse osmosis system, but you're using electricity to make it much more efficient instead of applying pressure. Um, 
So very efficient, especially very efficient at low concentration of ions. So we can purify that last bit. We need to have less than 20 ppm organic acids in our end product, or else it will not be polymer gray. That's what we want. So this is a system is very good for this. Um, our CTO actually spent two years at Argon co-developing this uh, early on. Um, we need to evaporate a lot of water. So this is an example of evaporating it. This is just in a road evap. In, a, in the full process, we'll basically have three stages of vacuum evaporation in, in row, but for the lab scale, we can do a road evap, which is lovely simple. Uh, and you can see here, as we evaporate the water, we up concentrate our MEG and we lose a little bit, but overall we can bring it from about six or 3% up to 60 to 70%. That's a lot better onset for the, for the purification. The same thing here just goes, um, how, how the losses go as a function of time in terms of uh, MEG left in the pot. Then we do distillation. This is vacuum distillation. We built this, actually it was built us also here, we moved it um, and it moved well, which I was very happy with, a lot of glassware. Um, so we basically distill off the water first and then the MEG from the rest, and then we can get to 100% efficiency. So this is, this is from a binary mixture of water and, and MEG, but this shows us that we can, in, in a matter of hours, get to 100% pure MEG. And we have actually repeated that recently with our pure crude. This is the team. Um, uh, we actually have two hires that's not on there yet. We are now 12 people full time. Um, but this is our team when we were up on the third floor um, and, and really shows our beginning here. So we are really excited about the next steps um, as well as our roots. For any students that are here online, we actually have uh, internships this summer. Uh, so there's an opportunity that will close in a couple of days, both in process engineering and R&D. Uh, we have three internships um, that are online. Please go to our website, RenewCO2 uh, slash careers um, and, and take a look at it. We are just across the bridge when it's working. So it's usually not too bad. Um, so with that one, I wanna make you um, hope I have um, bestowed upon you or given you an, a sense of is we can actually make carbon negative materials today and we can deal with the industrial decarburization while still making a profit for the company so that they're motivated to do the right thing. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and invite any questions. Thank you, Anders, that's terrific. So uh, questions from the room first, perhaps? Hi, uh, great talk and, and uh, you know, great work. And I hope that uh, you guys go from strength to strength. Uh, my question is about um, enzymatic CO2 capture. Since you mentioned that you started with, you know, getting inspiration from enzymes, um, I know that there had been some work on using enzymes directly for capturing carbon dioxide, given all their favorable properties. So where is that and, and how does that stack up in terms of the, the TEA and, and LCA and stuff like that? Well, that's a very good question. I haven't seen anything either where LCAs or TEAs have been done on that. Um, usually the issue is what you can make today. You can make um, methane. And so uh, methane is horribly cheap um, excuse me, from, from fracking. So it's really hard to be cost competitive on, on a simple hydrocarbon like that. Um, so I, at, a, at the core of it, it's very energy efficient, but you have to give the energy in the right form. There's a little bit of being done where you are, you're getting, um, you're growing a, a film of, of, of um, organisms on an electrode and you're trying to supply them that energy as electrons. But really inherently, that's not what the enzymes want, right? They want ATP or, or NADP. Sharing, I forgot something, I'll be right back. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. I was thinking more of like making uh, carbonic and hydrase, and then you can make formate from there too, mm -hmm. uh, from bicarbonate. Yeah, so, I, again, I haven't seen anybody any, taking that that, mm -hmm. that further. Um, okay. I suspect that the difficulty is in getting them to perform as well on an, as, on an electrode as they would in the native system, because supplying that electron very fast, they are so efficient, right? Right. right. Uh, and in the right form, that becomes the, the, yeah. the barrier. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. Uh, great talk. So I have one question. Initially, you, you were showing up about the nickel phosphate, right? 
and uh, you got the motivation uh, mo motivation from the nickel and iron catalyst so what motivates you to replace the iron with phosphorus which is like totally different in the periodic table right it's oh yeah transition metal and this is like totally p block element so what motivates you to replace uh iron with the phosphor phosphorus um very good question um that we are not on. replacing iron with with uh, phosphorus i'm trying to go back to the slide here if i can um but basically what we are trying to do is actually replace the nitrogens and the sulfurs uh, on the nickel uh, with phosphorus. And the reason for that is, I don't know, oh, maybe this will work better. Um, go back to that slide, here we go. Um, so basically we had the choice between iron and nickel. Um, mm -hmm. We've done some work, uh, as I said, on nickel phosphites in general. So we knew that those were very stable materials, good at binding hydrogen. It's all coming sort of together, right? Um, but one of the things we were noticing is you have the the, the larger overlap, um, the sulfur with the nickel, and you, electron density is being pushed onto those nickels. Now you have the iron as well, has the same thing. You have electron density being donated. Now using phosphorus gives us larger orbital overlap mm -hmm. with the center metal and gives us the ability to push in more electrons into the material. So uh, equivalent from nitrogen compound to phosphorus and then trying to get greater over overlap because they're more stable. We had looked at nickel sulfides and they were not terribly stable in aqueous media. So we knew we had to do something to stabilize this um, as, as an inorganic compound. Okay. I have one more question. May I go ahead? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was, uh, I think you are also a little bit of familiar with the homogeneous carbon dioxide catalyst, like the radium, manganese, all those things. Mm -hmm. So what is making your heterogeneous catalyst a little bit different? Because in homogeneous catalyst, radium, manganese, they used carbon dioxide, that is C1, and they are getting most of the cases, methanol or uh, formic acid, everything is C1. So what is making this heterogeneous catalyst from C1 to C3, C4 product? So what is the actual mechanism. I know that you are showing some mechanistic slide, but I yeah, I mean some of this is is unknown for sure. Um, so um, th these are not as simple metals as a platinum single uh, crystals. Like I I came from a my as my uh, Stephen said my background is in physics. That a lot of single crystal platinum, a lot of single crystal copper, different facets, and you can get a lot of insights. Um, we don't have that opportunity with the nickel phosphides. They are not very easy to make into crystals like that. Um, so it's limited what we know. What we do know is that this, this triangle seemed to be very important because only the structures that has that were particularly efficient. The phosphorus as well, obviously there was a, a correlation with phosphorus in terms of, of uh, the efficiency. So what we believe is that the triangle will allow you to have multiple, and there are DFT studies out there, both from the Rappi group and the Musgrave group with Colorado Boulder um, that has looked at this. Um, there's a particularly good paper uh, by Karen on iron phosphide, actually, we got, did look at that. Um, and looking at the different reaction intermediates uh, using multi-scale DFT, it seems the reason why this works to make more is because you have this triangle or these multiple metal sites where you can start shuffling in formaldehyde intermediates and react them with each other. Because on copper, it's believed that you have, if you go a CC chain, you can either go CH and then start to try and, and do that, or the CO binding to, its, to each other. And again, CO has a lot of back bonding. It bonds almost always pointing straight up, getting that to do anything else and sort of react with the, the CO next to it. That's an energy barrier you usually don't wanna pay. So one of the reasons a lot of things tend to stop at CO is honestly because it binds very strongly there. Uh, a few routes, as you say, goes to formic acid. It's believed that that's almost two different pathways. Where either you go through CO or you go through formic acid. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why the, the single um, sites like the, um, like the complexes, same thing when people are doing single atom, you know, as best they can, single atom chemistry um, on these highly dispersed um, sites, they also seem to get TO, methanol, maybe methane. But you just don't have Correct. a site for coupling. Greg Critchler has a question. Uh, um, thank you for the talk. You mentioned the phosphorus is binding hydride as part of the catalytic mechanism. Mm -hmm. And when often when people talk about hydrogen catalysis, they talk about platinum. 
mm -hmm. or palladium. And if I remember correctly, nickel is directly above those on the periodic table. So you have this nickel phosphorus lattice, um, and you want to minimize hydrogen evolution. So how does the, because you said the geometry is important, you talked about different crystal forms. How is there a correlation between that packing between the nickel and phosphorus and how the hydrogen ends up being either evolved or properly utilized in this? And, and, and how, how's the nickel playing the role in that? That's a very good question. Um, the indication so far that we have, um, both from our research on this, is that there is a correlation between nickel, platinum, and palladium. We actually, uh, NI5P4, we, we demonstrated, I did a paper on this a number of years ago now, we can actually get as good performance from that for hydrogen evolution as platinum. So there is clearly a structure relationship. Um, NI5P4 has 54, 59 atoms in a unit cell. It's terribly complex to do anything with, unfortunately. So understanding what their surface actually looks like was difficult. But yes, I think there is a structural relationship on the hydrogen as well. Um, probing it in an appropriate way has been difficult, I think is, is the, the way to answer that part of your question. But absolutely, there's a structural relationship. And um, we've tried to draw that correlation in hydrogen as well. And it, it's not as straightforward. So Ni5P4 is the most active for hydrogen evolution. Ni3P is the second most active. So you, you don't have that like straightforward correlation as you're seeing with the CO2 reduction. Terrific. Can I just ask a couple of uh, sort of vulture capital type questions? So, Absolutely. So um, when are you imagining or what are you telling your board as to when you're going to get to uh, uh, break even? Uh, yes. So um, we believe that in... in the microphone for the people oh, online. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll go over here. Uh, so... How we are viewing this is we're doing our pilot demonstration. We're actually starting to generate revenue by selling some of these units. Mostly it's at cost. We are not making money off of this yet, um, but it shows that the path and the drive is there. Um, we believe that in six to seven years, because these are going to be quite expensive. So a full scale module is um, a full scale solution. So what, let me preface it. For ethylene glycol, what you want to do is grow your plant, your existing plant by about four to five percent a year because that's how much the market grows. That installation alone, one sale there, it's 40 million dollars. So we can go from negative to neutral and then beyond that at a single sale. They are going to be massively expensive, um, but that allows us to to go um, break even as soon as we can get the first couple right. off the board uh, off the production line. And so we believe that 27 or so um, 28 is going to be when we can terrific it. well we will be coming back to you for a donation to the rutgers institute for quantitative <laughs> biomedicine where you got your start um i'm sure the chemistry department will be coming to you as well um the I and mean, i think the key for the for everyone in the audience who's ever thought about trying to make a company the key is reduction to practice you have to have a brilliant idea that you know no one's ever thought of you have to secure the patent protection or the trade secret protection to ensure that you can pursue this, um, and then you are, and then you have to reduce this to practice in a way that you can actually get from A to B with the money that you could raise at, at each stage of, of the process. And I think we've just seen a terrific example of how that can be done, and the importance of structure in determining function, because without the right microscopic structure. For your uh, your catalyst, you'd be dead in the water. Exactly. Yeah. So let's please join me again in thanking Anders. And uh, I could be graduate students. Please join me and Anders in three oh six for um, for lunch and an opportunity to talk about what it what it takes to become a scientific entrepreneur. And thank you, Michael Joy. Thank we you. had. 50 plus people between the audience online and the audience uh, in the room. So excellent showing. Thank you.